Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on this webinar. Uh, I'm uh, really very excited to be hosting this webinar with my co-host uh, from Red Hat and Penguin Computing. So uh, the title for our webinar today is Accelerate AI, ML, and Cloud Native Workloads with Wake.io, Penguin Computing, and Red Hat. And we'll be covering that for next uh, 45 minutes or so. My name is Shailesh Manjekar. I head AI and Strategic Alliances here at Weka. And um, I would let drop on my esteemed colleagues uh, from Red Hat and uh, Penguin Computing to introduce themselves. Uh, Sherard? Hi, everyone. This is Sherard Griffin from Red Hat. I am the Director of Engineering for our AI services. And that includes working with uh, communities such as opendatahub.io and uh, Kuber and Kubeflow to enable AI ML workloads on top of Kubernetes and, and OpenShift, as well as some of our products related to uh, AI ML, such as Red Hat OpenShift Data Science. Thanks, Sherard. Eddie? Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Eddie Blanton. I'm the Director of Solutions Enablement at Penguin Computing. I work within our strategic solutions group to help uh, enable these solutions that we package from partners such as Weka and Red Hat onto platforms that customers can sell and consume. Thanks, Eddie. So yeah, folks, uh, in next 45 minutes or so, uh, we are really excited to be presenting to you um, uh, this entire strategy around uh, how to accelerate AI ML uh, data pipelines. So uh, in the first part, I'll have um, Sherard, share with you uh, Red Hat strategy and how they see the AI ML market evolving around OpenShift container platform, which is a Kubernetes distro from Red Hat and the open data science uh, platform, which is the MLOps platform. And then I'll talk about how Wake Up plays a very crucial role uh, in terms of high performance uh, data platform uh, enabled by Kubernetes. And then I'll hand it over to Eddie to bring it all home or bring it all together as to how they package all of this into a solutions reference architecture. So with that, uh, Sherard, you want to give us a sense of what you guys are seeing in the marketplace around AI ML pipelines and challenges? Yes, thanks Shailas. Uh, one of the first things that anyone who's tried to do AI and ML before will tell you is it is not trivial and it may see it's not quite rocket science, but it's also not as simple as developing applications. As we talk to customers in this industry, what we found is that uh, focusing on AI ML is not just about what you traditionally think of as the data scientist, but instead it starts way before that with business leaders and data engineers as they start to craft goals and prepare the data. Then you go into developing the model uh, building out intelligent applications that integrate the models, the model management, model monitoring, and then also the cycle repeats itself as you start to retrain the models for more accuracy. If you look at that entire span of workloads, uh, it really has a number of different personas that interject themselves in different states and different parts of the cycle, anywhere from your business leaders to your data engineers, data scientists, machine learning engineers, app application developers, and IT operations, they all have to work together. They have, all have to work consistently and cohesively in order to deliver uh, these types of really challenging projects. And what we'll talk about today is why it's important that you have the, fun the fundamental foundational pieces of your infrastructure that enables all of these levels to work together and integrate together in a highly efficient and highly ex accelerated uh, environment so that you can execute on your AI ML goals. Next slide, Shalish. What we look at is how do we come up with an architecture that can fulfill the needs of all of those personas? And what I like to show here is a desired architecture that many, many customers, many industries try to seek. And I'll start from the bottom of this diagram and work my way up. The lowest levels is the infrastructure itself. There's, when you look at almost every customer that we talk to, uh, none of them have all of their data, all of their applications running in a single data center. Uh, there's combinations of physical, virtual, private cloud, public cloud, edge, you name it. They're all, they're all over the place. So when you look at solutions, what you want to do is find something that can allow you to leverage all of those. 
And then layer on top of that, your accelerators, your things like the GPUs, FPGAs, TPUs, DPUs, um, all these types of accelerators need to be available in this infrastructure, whether it's physical or virtual or edge. Then on top of that, you want some level of hybrid cloud services that allow you to get access to that data, accelerate your workloads, not just in one data center, but across many different types, because you'll have issues like data gravity, or you'll have issues where your applications are running in different locations than where the data resides. And so it's important that you have this, this approach where you can have this hybrid cloud and, and have these, uh, these hybrid workloads running across all of these different data centers. And then of course, on top of that would be your machine learning data pipelines and your machine learning de and DevOps tools that allow you to manage all of this. So if, if you look at this vertically top, you know, bottom to top, getting the infrastructure correct allows you to piggyback off of all of those capabilities and then all the way at the top of this are your ML and DevOps tools that all the personas will use. You have to get those foundational infrastructure pieces correct first so that you can take advantage of the tools and really accelerate your, your, your time to market with whatever projects you're working on. Next slide. Now, one of the reasons that uh, Red Hat has been talking to customers about AI and ML is because of the way we've approached containers, we've approached DevOps, as well as OpenShift. And a lot of customers ask, how does OpenShift fit into this picture? How do containers fit into this picture? Well, it's very simple. When you start to look at the benefits of what containers offer customers, you know, one of the key things is the agility, being able to respond quickly, uh, being able to automate your, re your compute and resource management. If you need more CPUs or more RAM or more GPUs, it's very easy and flexible to do that with containers and OpenShift. Portability is another critical area. How do you develop and deploy these ML models that allow you to, as I mentioned in the previous slide, deploy your workloads into the private cloud, public cloud, edge, whatever your infrastructure demands are. You want that consistent view, you want that consistent portability so that you can just really easily move those workloads between the different data centers. Flexibility is another key one. How do you have an environment that you can provision really quickly as you need it, if you need more hardware added or you need changes to your topology or topography, it's very easy to do. You've got that flexibility to, uh, to uh, dynamically change what, what your environment looks like, but then also really rapidly spin up new environments. And then also scalability. One of the critical things about AI workloads is it requires an intense amount of resources. And you don't always know what resources you need ahead of time. So you need a system that'll scale to meet your demands. Do you have a training job that took 10 days to complete and you need to throw more hardware to get that down to a couple of hours? You know, OpenShift and containers, it's a great way to be able to tackle that type of problem. Next slide. Uh, so AI adopters, when I talk about containers and OpenShift, it's not just Red Hat that's, that looks at this and, and, and uh, tries to talk about why containers are the best. The market itself has really gravitated toward that. And so if you look at uh, recent trends in the industry, 94% of AI adopters uh, are planning or are already using containers within one year. And that's a tremendous change in adoption. And, and, and there's a reason for that, for this, this, the reasons I stated earlier, the portability, the scalability, the consistency that it offers you. When you're talking about AI, where reproducibility and being able to, to, to reproduce results and accuracy in your model, no matter where you're running that model is critical, then you, something like containers allows you to have that, that's, that, that single consistent model that you can port across workloads. All right, next slide. Overall, if you look at Red Hat's strategy for how we're tackling AI ML workloads, um, we're starting with customer stories that uh, in the value of containers, the value of Kubernetes and DevOps. Uh, and, and what we're trying to showcase is why Kubernetes and, and containers best suit themselves for these types of workloads. OpenShift is great for being able to orchestrate your containers, especially as you need to scale up, scale out. Uh, and then looking at how we can help customers accelerate their projects from pilot to production using the combination of OpenShift, DevOps, Kubernetes, and containers. Another area that we focus on is something called Open Data Hub, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a subsequent slide. 
but uh, it's a it's a hundred percent open source way to be able to allow customers and and anyone really to go out there and build out their AI ML pro, uh, platform on top of open source uh, Red Hat as well as partner technologies like what we have with Weka. And so we work really closely with our partners to build out this AI ML ecosystem that's not just about the infrastructure, but then also the applications that run on top of it. Uh, and we have many partners that we, we work with in that space, and I'll talk about that later on. But then also the hardware acceleration and, and getting access to the data and combining technologies such as Weka and Ceph storage to be able to really give customers that value add and, and, and allow them to accelerate a lot of their workloads and get access to their most critical data for their AI ML projects. And then last but not least, very recently, we've introduced uh, a, a project called uh, Red Hat OpenShift Data Science, and I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. So for Open Data Hub, um, you think of it as, uh, as I mentioned before, it's an entirely open source project. And if you looked at the previous slides where I showed everything from the business leader all the way down to the IT operations person, and then everyone in between like the data engineer and, and the machine learning uh, engineer and, and the data scientist, I mentioned that they all have to work together in order to deliver a successful project. Well, Open Data Hub tries to tackle that by combining popular industry uh, open source technologies, as well as Red Hat and partner technologies to bring, a, to bring together a cohesive system to be able to uh, showcase how you can have all of these different personas working together. So it's a great blueprint for being able to highlight what's capable in OpenShift. And you know, if you go to opendatahub.io, you'll see a great example of how you can leverage all of these different technologies on top of Kubernetes and OpenShift. Next slide. And recently uh, in uh, Red Hat Summit 2021, this year, we announced our brand new product called Red Hat OpenShift Data Science. This is based on the upstream Open Data Hub project and what we've done is we've taken that, that same exact goal of bringing together our partner ecosystem like Weka and, 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 and Penguin and, and all the other partners we work with, plus the Red Hat technologies like our Red Hat Ceph storage and deliver a product that will allow customers to have a managed platform in the cloud where they can experiment with these, with these technologies and really get some quick value uh, into their ecosystem. And so the great thing about Red Hat OpenShift Data Science is it allows for customers to do some rapid prototyping, rapid experimentation. And then if you like what you've done, you can take that into an on-prem environment or a private cloud or, or, or some other environment that's, that's running on OpenShift and take that same experience and, and plug in Weka and plug in uh, uh, Ceph and get some hardware from Penguin and and bring all these things together to really continue to accelerate your workloads. Next slide. Going back to the various steps of uh, what we talked about before in terms of gathering the, the data, developing the model, integrating the model into, uh, into intelligent apps and monitoring. Uh, I just wanted to really highlight the different, the different partners that we work with and how we're bringing all of this together. So if you look at the very lower layer of this, we work very closely with NVIDIA to ensure that we have great accelerators for GPU workloads. Uh, then you look at the hybrid cloud self-service capabilities. We have OpenShift dedicated and as, as well as Red Hat OpenShift uh, on Amazon Web Services. And then if you look at the Red Hat managed cloud services, we provide services for Kafka, OpenShift Data Science, uh, OpenShift uh, API management, and then on top of that, we're, this is where we have our partners. We have managed cloud services like Starburst Galaxy, uh, Anaconda Commercial Edition, and then a whole slew of partners that work with that entire ecosystem like Weka and, and Sheldon and some of the others. So lots of innovation happening, lots of technologies being pulled together to give you, the customer, the ability to go from zero to 60 really quickly and, and not have to worry about all of the all of the headaches of of building out this infrastructure uh, yourselves, and and we try to short you know kind of short circuit that entire process. Uh, and this is another slide just to show how embedded we are with the ecosystem. You see Weka I/O right in the middle of it. You see Penguin Computing. 
you know, we work really closely with 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 uh, with uh, Weka and Penguin to make sure that we're truly providing accelerated workloads to, for you, really improving your infrastructure, providing all the tools you need, uh, so that when you get to some of the tools that are sitting a layer above that, such as Cloudera and H two O and SaaS you know that the infrastructure part of this is, is phenomenal. You know that it's very well uh, curated and orchestrated to where uh, you're getting access to the data as quickly as possible. And you know, some of the questions we always get is, well, who's using these types of solutions? Uh, this is just a slide just to show generically uh, the adoption that we've had with OpenShift and uh, for AI ML use cases. Uh, we've had everything from uh, healthcare to the financial industry to uh, autonomous driving and, and, and car uh, vehicle manufacturers, oil and gas. Uh, it, it's just a, a wealth of various different industries. Uh, it, it's, it's not a single vertical. It's not a couple of verticals. It really is you know, just spanning a lot of different industries. And, and what we're able to show is that um, at the core of all of this, you know, when we help customers get their infrastructure right and accelerate access to data, then that really does make the entire process of building out these applications uh, just that much easier. And so, um, you know, we continue to work with partners. We love talking to them about their use cases, but then also highlighting the value of partnerships like with Weka and Red Hat and, and Penguin Computing and, and showing what we can do for their workloads. All right, and, and that's it for my part of this. And I'm gonna kick this off to Shilas and he'll talk to you a little bit, of, uh, talk to you a little bit more about uh, Weka's solution in this space. Thanks, Sherrod, that was a great overview. Uh, so folks, uh, next uh, few slides, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, Weka data platform and how we play with Kubernetes uh, with Red Hat and Penguin Computing. So just a little bit of uh, background about Weka. Uh, we have eight of the Fortune 50 customers today, and they are across different verticals. We have customers uh, in financials, fintech. We have customers doing AI, ML, and we have customers doing life sciences in an open shift environment uh, with uh, Penguin as a partner. Uh, we are actually backed by pretty much industries who's who. So you can see uh, big names there like Cisco, Hewlett Packard, NVIDIA, and so on. And what that means is they are not just investors, but they also help us from a go-to-market perspective. So some of them uh, OEM us, some of them resell us. And that makes, uh, makes it a lot more easier for us uh, to go to market. We by ourselves, we are a next generation uh, parallel distributed file system uh, designed grounds up of our NVMe flash and also designed to leverage S3 as a backend protocol. We are purely software defined and we work on a number of our storage platforms, our storage server platforms, as well as in AWS marketplace. So if you look at a typical pipeline, uh, there are several moving parts to it as shown in this particular slide. So the data lands into a high performance NAS or an object store, and then you got to uh, copy it into either a local NVMe uh, storage tier, or you copy it into a uh, disaggregated um, HPC storage tier. Then you need to move that data to an DR copy, as well as you employ some data movers to create a backup copy of, of that same data set. So as you can see, there are several moving parts to this data set. There are multiple copies. And the reason why you need to do that is each of those storage silos are optimized for a certain kind of uh, workload environment, right? So some of them are optimized for sequential, some of them are optimized for, um, you know, um, high performance and, and so on and so forth. And what that means for a particular data pipeline, it, it, it results into delayed time to market, it results into delayed time to insights and so on. If you compare and contrast that with Weka, Weka is able to consolidate all of this into a single data platform because of our ability to handle uh, exceptionally may well mixed workload. Okay, so we handle metadata IOs, we handle large streaming IOs as well as uh, random read writes extremely well uh, throughout that platform. That's how uh, our file system is architected. Uh, and we are also a multi-protocol data platform. So we support S3, we support SMB, we support NFS, uh, we support and full-featured POSIX compliant uh, file system, as well as we support next generation of IO technologies like uh, GPU direct storage, 
uh, from NVIDIA. Uh, also uh, building into the file system is the ability to do backup and recovery. So you, we have this utility called snap to object, which not just takes a data snapshot, but also takes the metadata snapshot. Uh, so you are able to uh, completely uh, take a file namespace and then move it around uh, uh, pertaining to your needs. And what that result, results is really into high speed ingest as well as faster business outcomes. Uh, and uh, for the customer, it means, you know, competitive advantage for him, faster outcomes, and his ability to beat his competition. So we talked, uh, Shara talked uh, about Kubernetes. However, uh, you know, the 80% of the enterprises list, uh, um, you know, persistent storage and disaster recovery as top barriers for container adoption. And doing containers uh, at scale or Kubernetes at scale is really hard. Uh, it, it also needs to extend the benefits, not just to cloud native applications, but also to non-cloud native or business applications. Uh, you got to be able to better utilize those expensive GPU resources when you are using uh, um, in a Kubernetes environment and improve productivity. And then of course, you know, a statefulness is, is very paramount when you're talking about really enterprise applications, but that's a good first step. Beyond statefulness, you got to be able to disaggregate the compute and storage layer. You got to be able to create a performance and capacity tier independent of each other. You got to be able to provide data protection, data mobility, DR and hybrid workflows. So, so those are some of the challenges when it comes to Kubernetes at scale. So uh, what Weka tends to focus on are three particular use cases I'll hi highlight as to how Weka is able to add value. So the first one is about uh, you know, single instance databases or big data analytics or NoSQL databases, uh, what uh, Sherrod talked about. And these applications, uh, traditionally they have been using um, high performance uh, or direct attached storage model. And that's primarily because they are driven by low latency and high throughput, right? So those are kind of the requirements for these applications. Now, when you start working in a Kubernetes environment, uh, it breaks that model because you know you cannot have a Kubernetes pod assigned to a local drive or a local uh, storage server because you know you need data mobility, you need that elasticity. So what Weka is able to effectively provide is provide the same latency and throughput benefits even in a shared storage environment and work very effectively in a Kubernetes environment. Okay, where you you can deploy your pods uh, and persistent volumes uh, for this particular use cases. The second use case is an autonomous vehicle use case. So this is one of our uh, customers, existing customers doing AI ML data pipeline across uh, and data pipeline, which spans uh, core to uh, edge to core to cloud, right? So here there is an autonomous vehicle which comes to a carport and uploads all of that data to an edge aggregation point. So that's where Weka runs. So Weka doesn't run on the edge endpoints, it runs on the aggregation point. And then there is a core where most of the model training happens and then we leverage the cloud for economies of scale. And on the compute side, you see this massive uh, GPU compute layer or, or all orchestrated uh, with Kubernetes and containers running on top of that. And at each phase of that pipeline, somewhere you are doing uh, ingest, somewhere you are doing data labeling, uh, somewhere you are doing um, DNN, or deep neural network tra training, uh, you are doing hardware in loop simulations and so on and so forth and then you get into lifecycle management. So at every stage, your storage requirements or storage IO requirements are very different. Somewhere you're doing massive write bandwidth, somewhere you're doing ETL processing with random read writes, then you're doing model training, which is all about random reads. And then you do you know, uh, the simulation, which is all about streaming read and writes. So you really need a storage layer, which can effectively meet all of these storage requirements. And as I outlined, most of the storage um, solutions out there today are optimized for one kind of, um, of storage IO requirements. Weka is in a very unique position uh, where with our mixed workload handling, we are able to cater to the entire pipeline and that's why we are winning with this kind of projects. The third example I wanted to quickly highlight is a CI CD pipeline. So, you know, you have a continuous integration done by the development team and then they're using infrastructure as a code, literally using the YAML file to be able to instantiate and pod cluster, uh, but you need a Kubernetes management platform and you need persistent volume claims. So this is where they're using us, okay? Uh, 
Uh, this is how a typical Weka architecture looks like in a Kubernetes environment. Uh, you have the controller and then you have the parts and on the controller, you, um, you formulate the YAML file and then on each of the worker nodes, you have the Kubelet running um, and you have the, the uh, it, uh, CLI where you can use it for configuration. And then you have several different parts running um, through this entire pipeline. And this is where the persistent volume claim comes into picture because you want to provide the persistent for an entire cluster, as opposed to you know what we have empty DIRs, which are only uh, you know they pertain to only the local storage. So you need a persistent volume claim where you can have persistent across that entire cluster, where you are passing results across different phases within an AIML pipeline. You're doing checkpointing and so on and so forth. So our CSI plugin is an open source plugin. It's available on GitHub. Uh, we provide both uh, you know, uh, persistent volume claims, uh, both in terms of static provisioning as well as dynamic provisioning. And Weka can be deployed in a number of ways. It can actually get deployed in a converged architecture right on the GPU servers itself, or it can get deployed in a dedicated mode where you have us running on in a uh, on storage servers, or you could have it deployed in uh, in the cloud in AWS, and particularly for open data science, uh, what um, Sherrod talked about, which is a managed service in AWS, that's where we can be deployed in AWS as well. Yeah. So that's kind of how the reference architecture looks like. Uh, some of the value propositions what we bring to the table is we provide we are able to provide better performance than local NVMe flash because of our POSIX agent, which can now talk to multiple storage nodes. We are able to match the parallelism of our containers and microservices architecture. We can handle mixed workloads very effectively, uh, build in data protection, and particularly for AIML applications, when you have large uh, training jobs running, you need, pipe, uh, you need those pipelines to be able to do checkpoint. That's where persistent volume claims come to, into picture. Uh, you also need the ability to hand over results uh, from different phases, whether you're doing ingest work, whether you're doing labeling, whether you're doing training. Okay? Uh, we are able to uh, better utilize those expensive GPU resources by making sure that they're very well uh, utilized. And then of course, in a database environment, we eliminate sprawl and volume, small, volume and multiple copies. Uh, as I said, uh, we are the highest performing file system today on the market, but we also have a lot of data management capabilities. So snap to object is a utility which uh, takes uh, the you know, snapshot of an entire file namespace through a single click environment and then returns you an object locator, uh, which you can now use to uh, rehydrate the file system, to move that file system to another object store, to the cloud and so on and so forth. So that becomes a ba basic building block uh, for uh, you know data mobility, for DR, for backup, and so on and so forth. And with that, I'll hand it over to Eddie to bring it all together as to how they are putting this all together in the solution architecture, which is uh, Penguin Computing's Origin AI. Eddie? Thank you, Shailesh. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna jump right into this. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about the software stack that we use to help uh, put all these technologies together on a common platform. So uh, Penguin Computing has a, uh, you know, uh, a cluster provisioning software stack called Skill Clusterware. Um, what this does is it takes the environment, um, you know, the, the, the servers, the networking, et cetera, and uh, it, you know, it stands it up, uh, you know, has a lot of common services such as DHCP, Pixie, component monitoring, metric collection. Uh, it creates some uh, virtual nodes uh, to manage the environment, to log into the environment, et cetera. Um, it comes with a system image repository, so it can store node images that you built. Um, so if you build a node to a specific workload, you can save that image. It'll store it in its repository, and as you add new images or new nodes into the environment, you can, uh, it can automatically provision those nodes with those images that you've stored. Um, it integrates with a uh, Kubernetes schedule such as Red Hat OpenShift, so it can help deploy uh, OpenShift and OpenShift, uh, um, you know, the OpenShift scheduler onto nodes so that you can uh, orchestrate the environment with uh, uh, batch-driven workloads or containerized workloads for AI and ML, uh, you know, environments. So all this together, uh, we, uh, we deploy onto our Origin AI solution. Uh, which here in this uh, diagram is uh, is what we uh, define as an enterprise AI ML environment. 
So uh, Origin AI operates in the infrastructure layer that you see at the bottom. So we, uh, a, a lot of customer um, or organizations in general have their technologies broken up into a few different layers. There's the user layer, and then there's uh, where all the workloads run, all their applications happen. It's, it's really where um, the, they perform their work, right? Um, that sits on top of the infrastructure layer, which is all the servers, all the frameworks, all the, uh, the, applic all the, um, the technologies like Weka and OpenShift, et cetera. Um, and that's broken up into software, compute, data, uh, the infrastructure itself, and then all the services that tie it together. And that's what Penguin offers as a solution. Uh, so in the software technology sp space, you'll see uh, uh, Penguin and Red Hat uh, with Clusterware and OpenShift. The compute section, you'll see uh, things like NVIDIA GPUs with uh, the DGX A100 system. Uh, and then the data technologies layer, you'll see Weka FS, as well as Red Hat Ceph providing storage. And then... Um, uh, Penguin brings it all together with our uh, infrastructure and um, uh, services capabilities. Next slide. Uh, so what you he see here on the right is uh, three racks. There is the OpenShift environment. There's the uh, compute environment, which is commonly built with the DGX A100 systems, very common in the environment. And then the rack on the right is an example of a fully built out uh, Weka active data with WECAFS uh, solution. That's Penguin's uh, uh, Canon package solution that runs WECAFS. It runs on top of workload optimized uh, systems. So it provides that performance that you expect to see from Weka. So it really extracts the full capabilities of the storage. And then in addition to that, we um, put behind Weka because Weka can tier into an S3 object environment. We put our deep data uh, with Red Hat Ceph storage. Uh, the three blocks that you see here are uh, high-level snapshots of these racks. So on the left, you have Origin AI with OpenShift for the compute element of your AI workloads. Uh, and there's a, you can put about six uh, DGX A100 systems inside of a rack. So some uh, metrics there on what you can expect from a rack of Origin AI fully deployed, power, uh, networking, and performance. Uh, and then the middle block there is our Active Data WCFS. Uh, in a 40 node rack design, uh, the amount of capacity you can expect, such as uh, five, ter five petabytes of usable capacity, 400 gigabytes per second of random write performance uh, on 4K files, and then 1200 gigabytes per second of random read performance, um, similarly. And then the power uh, numbers for that as well. And then lastly is the uh, deep data with Red Hat Ceph, which is an eight node design. It also gives you about five petabytes of usable capacity per rack, although uh, it is a, a much more economical option for the scale-out part of any AI environment in terms of the storage. Uh, so what we do is we pair the compute and then the high-speed WECFS storage to provide the performance that the you know, AI computing uh, systems need to really saturate uh, you know, those GPU systems with as much data as possible so they can turn on it and, and learn very quickly. And then the Ceph environment sits behind that and stores uh, the massive amount of data that's needed to uh, really feed AI environments and make uh, AI models very smart uh, very quickly. So all that together creates an AI environment. Um, this slide here is very similar to the slide I just showed you. However, it uses a different computing um, uh, infrastructure. So where before we were showing you the DJX A100 system and a common EIA um, you know, rack uh, form factor, this one here uses an OCP rack uh, with an OCP version of the DGX A100 that's provided by Pang Computing. Uh, one of the benefits here is that we uh, are able to power the rack more efficiently so we can provide up to 10 nodes inside of the rack so it's a denser design, as well as liquid cooling, which allows you to really extract and remove the heat that comes out of those, uh, those very power hungry GPU systems, and then get it out of your data center. Uh, so that's a common challenge with putting these very high performance systems inside of a, a traditional data center is how do I power it and how do I remove that heat? Uh, so we help uh, uh, tackle those challenges with different types of rack level architectures, whether it's uh, traditional EIA or if it's in an OCP form factor for the customers that can take those systems. So here is our active data with WECFS solution, which we commonly pair as the storage uh, backend for Origin AI. Um, so uh, 
a lot of the uh, some of the use cases for uh, why active data WebFS versus other architectures such as local SSD, for example. Um, if uh, a lot of testing that we've done has shown that accessing storage over the network, and you can think of a 200 gig um, you know, network adapter, and DJX A100, for example, has uh, up to 10 of those inside of a system. Um, you can access a lot more throughput and IOPS by um, targeting storage that's uh, accessible over the network, such as a parallel file system, such as WECFS, uh, versus local uh, SSD. Uh, and so by moving the SSD out of the compute systems and onto the network um, accessed by a, a parallel file system, such as WECFS, we're able to get more performance to each uh, GPU computing system uh, as needed. And that is a very big challenge uh, in today's uh, landscape is I can buy these big, expensive, and powerful GPU systems, but how do I feed them and how do I saturate them with enough data to get the most out of my investment, right? And so using Active Data WCFS, you know, a workload optimized storage platform running the world's fastest file system, we're able to show that we can demonstrate that. And uh, we can demonstrate it at scale. So as you add more GPU systems, the performance is scales linearly. So it's one system, two systems, eight systems, et cetera. Uh, the performance is very consistent and very linear. And uh, a single uh, you know, GPU system, uh, we've been able to demonstrate 162 gigabytes per second of throughput and 970,000 IOPS to a single GPU client. Uh, and that is a, a very outstanding uh, performance metric in today's market. Uh, is achievable on active data with WECFS. So now I'm going to move into a, a customer. Uh, this is a real world uh, use case. A customer had this challenge. Um, they're traditionally an HPC uh, enterprise uh, environment, and they wanted to add AI into their data center, but they weren't sure how to um, unify an HPC and AI environment into one, you know, system. Uh, and so they reached out to us to help work with them to uh, design a, a computing and storage environment that could be unified with their HPC workloads uh, as one centralized environment. Next slide. The goals were to provide the capability to support both AI and ML uh, and HPC workloads as equal citizens inside of one environment. We also want to provide a very strong user experience and we did that by um, using a lot of uh, cloud technology. So creating a single portal where all these users can get into the same system, the underlying infrastructure provided uh, the capability to submit um, both types of jobs, whether they're batch driven or they're containerized uh, for HPC and AI workloads respectively, um, all through a common user experience that was very intuitive and easy to use. And then with any enterprise environment, it needs to be secure. So uh, we had to make sure that it was very secure. So what we're showing here is an example of what the environment looked like before uh, we started working with them. So uh, they had an HPC cluster. Um, Penguin has a prepackaged HPC cluster called TrueHPC. So they were running that environment with uh, Slurm as their workload manager and using some common uh, you know, accelerating technologies such as NVIDIA GPUs and with NVIDIA networking. And what we did was we added in an AI environment, next slide, uh, which is the Origin AI solution that we've been talking about today. So running Red Hat OpenShift for AI um, with K8s. Uh, and so now they had two environments. They had their, their traditional HPC environment, and then they had this new enterprise AI environment for all their AI workloads. So the next step was how do we saturate and feed these two very uh, data hungry systems to get the best out of uh, our investment into these systems. And so we accomplished that by adding in our active data with WECFS solution. So NVMe over POSIX, uh, NVMe over Fabric, POSIX, uh, you know, storage environment, they can be accessed in a number of different ways by a number of different um, environments, whether it's HPC or AI. Uh, so we were able to tackle that problem. The next problem was, um, how do we scale so that it can store a, a massive amount of data that's needed to train these systems? Next slide. So what we did was we put our deep data with Red Hat uh, Ceph storage solution behind active data. And because Weka can wrap uh, an S3 object storage that it's attached to in a single namespace, it looks like one storage solution. 
So you get the best of the performance that you need from the active data WECFS in, uh, in, you know, part of the environment. And then you get the economics and scale out capacity and resiliency of the deep data with Red Hat Ceph storage, but it's all one storage system from the application's point of view. Next slide. Uh, and again, with any enterprise environment, how do I protect my data uh, from bad actors? And so we added encryption across the entire environment uh, for both the HPC cluster, the AI uh, computing environment, and then the storage itself on active data and deep data side. Uh, the next step was, okay, so I have um, all these different users that need to access these um, very robust emerging technologies, right, that have been deployed on these different platforms. Uh, how do we get access to them? So what we did was we put a cloud environment on top of it, which uses, again, leveraging Red Hat OpenShift, but also some other Red Hat technologies like Red Hat OpenStack, um, as well as some access to some common clouds, such as the NVIDIA GPU cloud. Uh, and so this creates that portal that all of the uh, users inside of the organization can log in, they can, their accounts can be managed by their centralized IT team, um, and they can be given access to the appropriate computing resources and storage resources that they need based on the projects they have going on, and it's all accounted for inside of this private cloud environment that's uniquely tailored tailored for this organization. So we added in that uh, cloud experience. The next step was, okay, now that we've built this robust environment, how do we get it into uh, the organization and meet all of their security requirements? So everything's encrypted, but I need to get it onto the network, and that's a whole nother challenge in itself. So using payment computing services, we're able to work with the, uh, you know, the organization's uh, centralized IT team uh, and make sure that as we integrated these solutions and these technologies into the customer's environment, that we're meeting all their corporate security standards, you know, data separation, log scanning, virus scanning, patching schedules, two-factor authentication, et cetera. You know, it integrated with the, the security standards that they're already using, right? So it was all up to par and ready to go. So our services helped integrate that. The lessons that we learned were uh, we improved their productivity. Uh, because the, all these different um, groups of, of folks were able to access a common centralized environment and on a common platform using technologies like Red Hat OpenShift, they're able to work together uh, to uh, you know, accelerate their, their, their workloads and their processes, whether HPC or AI, um, improve resource utilization. So rather than having uh, you know, isolated um, uh, technologies throughout their environment. This is a centralized environment, so they're able to fund more uh, resources together into one easier to manage environment that's much more robust, that, you know, allows both batch, you know, driven uh, workloads and, uh, you know, containerized workloads with K8s and, uh, you know, the, the resource managers that come with them. Uh, and then, again, it's a cloud native environment, so uh, they can access it like any cloud, except it belongs to them. It can integrate with other cloud environments as well. Uh, and so they can scale out the, uh, the compute and the Weka storage and the Ceph storage as needed, or even connect into uh, a cloud storage like Weka, like AWS. Uh, and then the workload portability, again, really coming back to all those cloud technologies that are provided inside of this environment, um, like Red Hat OpenShift that really ties it all together. Uh, so all of this together, uh, was an example of how uh, payment computing services uh, were able to provide a complete AI environment for a very large uh, enterprise organization. And with that, um, the next steps uh, going forward, uh, please reach out to Penguin Computing if you would like to demo any of these uh, solutions, uh, any of these technologies on any of these Penguin solutions. Um, you can reach out to our sales team for any sales related questions and uh, go to our website where we have uh, solution briefs and um, a lot of collateral on uh, the testing that we did to really bring these technologies together on a common platform and provide that enterprise support that our customers expect. Thank you, Adi. Uh, thank you, Sharad. Uh, really appreciate you guys uh, joining me today on this webinar. <clears throat> and folks, uh, if there are any questions, we'll open it up uh, in the chat window. Um, so feel free to ask your questions, uh, but this concludes our webinar for today. Um, hopefully you got a sense of how customers are deploying AIML uh, data pipelines and what are the challenges and how uh, we collectively provide a solution. 
again thank you very much i appreciate uh, your time thanks